Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to speak to all of you. I certainly didn't expect this, uh, even a, a few hours ago, actually. In fact, it wasn't until uh, mid-morning yesterday that the decision was made that uh, services would be uh, canceled and that we would do a, a live webcast from here in the studio. We've never done this before to this magnitude, uh, so it's going to be quite a test for us. We're assured the technology is available and it's going to work, and we're certainly hopeful that it is working right now for all of you. Uh, we expect that most of the members of the church in the Western Hemisphere, uh, that would be the United States, Canada, uh, Central Amer Mexico, Central America, South America, uh, probably the Caribbean are all online uh, watching services here on the Sabbath day. In Europe, it's already beyond the Sabbath. In Africa, it's already beyond the Sabbath. And of course, in uh, Asia and New Zealand and Australia, it's, it's already well beyond the Sabbath. Uh, so we don't necessarily expect them to be on, but this will be our most ambitious effort. And it's probably a good test for us uh, to see if this can really work and work well. And we're certainly hopeful, and we've all prayed about it, that indeed it would happen. Uh, appreciated the comments that Mr. Horchak made, and of course, walking you through a bit of the history of what brought us to this point. In fact, I'm just absolutely amazed that yesterday at this time, I was still in Guatemala, uh, having been there for a trip, and, and wondering, quite honestly, if I was going to get home. It was a little shocking uh, momentarily when we were told the plane had been delayed, uh, of course, there was weather in Dallas, and the, the trip from Dallas to Guatemala and then back again is the same plane. Uh, so we were, we were feeling a bit anxious. Uh, we had to change our plans within only a couple of days' notice uh, to get a flight back to the United States. So literally, this time yesterday, I was in an airport in Guatemala City hoping to get home uh, yesterday afternoon. And, of course, the decision was made. We're obviously in touch, uh, have been in touch the period of time I've been gone. Uh, to be able to make the decision that was made about services. We consulted, of course, with Mr. Walker, uh, Mr. Meeker, uh, in discussing international areas. Obviously, Mr. Meeker is the uh, chairman of the Ministerial Board of Directors. So we wanted everyone involved in, in what is uh, possibly the, one of the biggest decisions, certainly one of the biggest decisions we've had to make since we began in the Church of God a Worldwide Association. I'd like to walk you through a little bit of that. I appreciated all that Mr. Horchak had to say as I lead into my sermon. And certainly my, uh, my intent is to give you a sermon here, a Sabbath day sermon, uh, certainly in preparation even for the uh, Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread that are coming up. Uh, but I would have to say that for me, the last two weeks have seemed like a lifetime. You know, it really seems like it was dragged out and and of course, whenever you're involved in something that's, that's happening, a, a major consequence, and it became pretty obvious about two weeks ago that this wasn't going to go away. Uh, this wasn't a minor event, and it was going to even get bigger uh, as we began to discuss it. So it, I, I sort of compare it. Mr. Horchak made the comparison to 9-11. You know, at 9-11, I remember exactly where I was, and you probably do as well. I also remember my father telling me that he remembered exactly where he was on December the 7th. Uh, 1941. So when, when these major events happen, it's like it just sharpens your, uh, your, you know, your, your feelings and sharpens your senses. And everything takes on a little bit of a different view. And that is exactly what happened to me in the last two weeks. And uh, er everything seemed to take on a different view. Two weeks ago, we were in Guatemala for the second of the International Leadership Program focused mentoring. We had 36 attendees and just a wonderful weekend. And these uh, international leadership program this second phase is going very well and we have the time uh, uh, the two of us that go to these uh, weekends we have the time to uh, get to know the individuals that are there in, in uh, several comments were made that this was so much more than what we did two years ago when we first began the program so it's, we've gotten a lot of good re, uh, results and a lot of good reviews from the program thus far so we were there two weeks ago and we had the, the conference, the weekend, the classes, and all was really going well, but this was sort of hanging in the background. What's really going to happen? Now, after attending the uh, conference and the classes, uh, my wife and I, along with our daughter Jamie, who lives in El Salvador, had made the decision to go to Antigua in Guatemala. Now, Antigua is world-renowned uh, for its uh, Spanish schools. And uh, it's been my desire, certainly over the past several months, to, 
to learn some Spanish. Now, how much it turns out to be is another question. Uh, it's a bit intimidating and a bit challenging, but I had made the decision to do that. So we uh, drove over to Antigua, Guatemala. Actually, uh, Mr. Uh, Luis Mundo, the pastor there in Guatemala, uh, drove us over to Antigua where we were to go to classes and take Spanish classes. Little did I know two weeks ago when we made that decision to take these classes that two weeks later I would be here in the studio speaking to all of you uh, instead of in El Salvador, which I had planned to be for the Sabbath and speaking to the small group there. Uh, how things have changed in the last two weeks. I, I could say this, or I would say this, that the last two weeks have been one of the most shocking two weeks, uh, I believe, in mo our modern history. I mean, I, I believe it'll be that, uh, that powerful and that, uh, that effective in the sense of how many people are effective. Uh, and I don't believe that's an exaggeration. Two weeks ago, the coronavirus was still a, kind of a step behind the flu in some people's minds, maybe most people's minds. It was an irritant, a blip on the screen. Uh, certainly not something that would any way affect our lives. At least that's what I thought. But here we are two weeks later and millions of lives have been affected, possibly even billions. You know, the population of the world is seven and a half billion people. How many are now affected? And I don't mean because of getting uh, the virus or coming down with, uh, you know, well, coming down with the virus, but just their lives are affected. So many people have had their lives affected. Country, countries that have no reported cases are closing borders, asking that group meetings be postponed or canceled altogether. And here in the United States, as Mr. Horchak referenced, when has it ever happened that all the major sports have postponed their seasons or, or suspended their seasons? Uh, major League Baseball here in the United States uh, postponing the beginning of the season, which was to start, I believe, within another week or so. Uh, absolutely amazing. Uh, states and counties across the U.S. have declared states of emergency. It seems like every day there's a new state, or uh, certainly many counties, as we have here in Texas, who are declaring a state of emergency. The President of the United States declared a national state of emergency yesterday and called for a day of prayer for tomorrow. These are unprecedented events. Uh, again, not that they haven't happened to some degree before. Or, you know, there have been uh, uh, national emergencies before. But you think about it and the magnitude of this and what's going on. I, I was, saw yesterday that the Czech Republic, a country, closed every restaurant and every bar in the country for 10 days. Now, I, again, I, I don't have a lot to compare it to. This is happening so fast. But when has that ever occurred before? The president of the Philippines just issued a statement last night for allowing for religious services, but forbidding anyone to touch another person during that service, maintaining this uh, distance around you that you don't even touch someone. Now, I've already been asked by uh, the ministry in, in the Philippines, well, what will they do about Passover? You, know, you think about that and the implications there. Uh, the president of the Philippines is a pretty tough guy. And will he enforce this? Uh, will he be able to do that? It's really quite amazing how quickly this all happened and how deeply it is being felt. And of course, we really don't even know the final toll. Uh, we can talk today about uh, so few people that have actually died. Uh, obviously, everyone's a tragedy. Everyone's a, a difficulty. Uh, many are elderly and obviously they have families. But th th the real question is, how many will? How far will this go? The truth is we really don't know the final death toll or final effect of the uh, coronavirus. We just don't know. And this is, quite honestly, what is most troubling. And we now know it has had an impact on the church. The fact that we're here, the fact I'm speaking to you, tells you that this has had an impact on the church. Now, to, to the best of my knowledge, and I've certainly not had any report of any church member anywhere in the world uh, contracting the uh, coronavirus. So that. That's obviously, uh, we're, we're, we're happy about that. We're glad that, that that has taken place. And we certainly pray that that will continue to be. So we have to be open and we have to be honest and we have to, to understand where we are. Uh, Mr. Horchak also made the reference, and, I, and again, a reference that I want to make, that it's interesting, and again, I, uh, obviously uh, things happen when they happen, but this is happening just before the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread. Now, 
you know, we've known, I've kept the Passover many years, as I know many of you have, that there can always be trials. There can be trials at any time of the year. It's not like they're just limited to before the Passover. But I don't think we've ever seen anything like this before a Passover. Certainly not in, in my history in the church. I remember one year that we had to cancel Passover in New England because of a blizzard. That was su such a very quick event that occurred. Stopped us from going to Passover. But literally, the storm was gone so quickly that we actually had services on the first day of unleavened bread. Uh, that's not necessarily uh, true here. By that, I mean that it's happening quickly or it's going to be gone quickly. Uh, we just simply don't know. Uh, Mr. Orchak made the reference that Satan, of course, is uh, desiring. We know that from what we read in Scripture, from what we know, chaos and confusion. And if there are two words that can describe the last two weeks, I think it would be chaos and confusion. And so, again, we, we know where some of that's coming from. And, of course, the sheer thought that we could be denied holding a Passover service is in itself shocking. And we're praying, certainly, that that does not happen. Uh, we have plans for the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread, and none of those have been altered at this point. Uh, but we will have to see what comes up. You know, uh, to give you another example, and, and a lot of the, what I'm talking about now is something you've probably read or heard about already. Uh, I certainly want to use this as an introduction to my sermon, and, and I do have a sermon for you. But consider this. Uh, consider the country of El Salvador. Uh, as I said, we were supposed to be there this Sabbath. It was another opportunity for me, and, and again, I, I, I uh, certainly uh, praise the members in, in Latin America for putting up with some of my Spanish. Uh, but it was another opportunity for me there today to be able to speak to them. And, and again, we're certainly getting uh, uh, to know a lot of the members in Central America and South America because of the International Leadership Program. So we were looking forward to that. Uh, but consider this one uh, country. Our original plan was to be there today for Sabbath services, but that all changed on Wednesday. On Wednesday, the president of El Salvador, a young man, the youngest president in their history, uh, made an announcement that he was closing all the borders of El Salvador. Now, here's a country that did not have a single case of uh, coronavirus, not a single one. And the president announced that he was closing the borders and that anyone who came in, even citizens, were subject to being put in an army base for uh, 21 to 30 days in quarantine. Uh, obviously, he was taking this very seriously, and I'm not, I'm not diminishing what he did. One of the things he didn't do, though, was to inform the parliament of what he was doing. And so, guess what? The parliament in El Salvador took offense at the president taking this unilateral action. And there were angry mobs at the airport in San Salvador. People were caught off guard. And some were told, you either go back to where you came from, or you're going to be put at a, an army base in a cot for the next three weeks. Our own daughter was planning to go back. She lives there in El Salvador. She, is a, a, a re, she has a resident card. She's a, a permanent resident. She could get into the country, but she had no guarantee that she would not be put in a, a camp where she would have to stay for 21 days or more, uh, even coming from Guatemala. Uh, so she chose to come back with us, and we, we got a flight out yesterday from Guatemala and flew back here to the United States. That was in a country I mean, to give you, this is to give you an idea of how this is being affected, how this is affecting the whole world. You know, we, we can see our little part of the world. We can see our little community. All of them may not be any toilet paper at Costco, whatever. We can see that. But I'll guarantee you there are more people affected by this than you can possibly imagine. And we saw it firsthand, and we experienced it firsthand. We were, all, we were very confident. I was confident all the way through Monday, Tuesday, even up to Wednesday. Well, you know, there, there are no cases here. Why will we have a problem going to El Salvador and then going home? Everything is fine in Latin America. Very few cases even. And you could name the countries on one hand where there were cases. And then Wednesday, all it took was for the president of El Salvador to announce that he was closing the borders and he was going to put this mandatory quarantine on any foreigner that came in and even any citizen. You either stayed. And then, of course, the, the airlines began canceling flights. And... Uh, the flight that we were to fly home uh, on from El Salvador was actually canceled. Uh, so we, we were able to grab a flight out of Guatemala City, and we actually got home about 7.30 uh, yesterday afternoon. 
was quite a harrowing experience. But this is only one example of a country far from the United States, far from Europe, far from China, without a single confirmed case, and yet 6.4 million people's lives were changed. That's what's happening. And that's the scary part of what's happening. You know, before the weekend is over, uh, most likely, travel anywhere in the world will be much more difficult than it was just two weeks ago. That's the amazing part, the speed of all of this. The speed of this should teach us that we're living a very different world than we did a decade ago or 20 years ago. Uh, Mr. Horchak referenced 9-11. I've referenced 9-11. But that was almost 20 years ago. My Spanish instructor in Guatemala never heard of 9-11. She actually, when I, I tried to explain it to her, even in my poor Spanish, you know, I, I at least know the numbers and I could give the number. And she had no idea what it was. And I had to explain to her what 9-11 was. 9-11 was a big deal to all of us. It was a big deal to a lot of other countries that were involved in what ultimately became the Iraq War and the war in Afghanistan and all the countries that were involved. You know, the longest war in American history. Uh, she had no clue. She, she's a, not a young person. She was probably in her late 40s, early 50s. She definitely was old enough that she could have remembered. But she had no clue. She's never been out of Guatemala. She teaches Spanish there. She's a, uh, an excellent Spanish teacher. Uh, but she didn't know. This is a different world, a different world today. To see, uh, for many, many years, think about this, brethren, even decades, we have speculated and questioned how could some of the prophecies of the Bible even be fulfilled. I, I've thought that. You know, look at, look at our country. Look at what the Bible says. How could that ever happen? You know, I've, I've had those questions, and, and maybe you've had them as well. Well, brethren, I can assure you, we have now arrived at that world. To see worldwide armies, worldwide disease epidemics take place would require a world so strongly connected and intertwined that a serious problem in any part of the world could threaten everyone. That was not true even 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, again, it could have happened. I'm not suggesting that, that it, we were so out of connection in the world at that time. It was certainly connected but not like it is today. Economically, uh, communication-wise, we're all so connected. And I believe, if nothing else, this proves that beyond the shadow of a doubt. We've now arrived at that world. To fail to see the prophetic implications in what is happening is to hide your head in the sand. Over the years, I've always been reluctant to declare any event as, well, that's a part of prophecy. I didn't want to do that at 9-11. Again, I, I'm not suggesting it isn't a part of a bigger picture of prophecy and things that are going to happen. But is it really fulfilling prophecy? Is there a prophecy you can point to where that's fulfilled? You know, I, I knew people at, at that time in 9-11 and, and even had friends who got into things and said, oh, well, this is this in prophecy. There are some people even found an obscure prophecy in Isaiah about a sycamore tree and said that's what happened on 9-11. And so there was supposed to be this sycamore tree that was somehow saved in 9-11 and is still alive today and that there was a prophecy in Isaiah about that and they looked for well where's where are the twin towers in prophecy and people became in some some cases became obsessed with that uh, today you don't have to strain very hard to see prophetic implications the worldwide fear and panic are should be enough to point us to prophecy what it portends for the future is still somewhat unknown but the fact that it screams the beginning of a very different time in which the global economy can crash with little warning, even in a time of prosperity. Two weeks ago, the stock market was raging. Now, look where the stock market is. And look how long it took, or I should say how short a time it took for all of that to happen. This should be a lesson for us. This should teach us something about the future about prophecy, but more importantly, brethren, and this is where I'm coming to, it should teach us something about ourselves. You know, all that I've talked about so far, you could, you could find it on the internet, you could read it for yourself, but how does that affect you? I come to a very central question to address to all of us today. How should the church react? Mr. Horchak covered some of that. But who are we? I think that's the more basic question. We've been tested over time in what we believe. 
we've all talked about that. Our beliefs are important. Our beliefs are critical. And I, I believe that uh, as much, if not more, than I've ever believed it before. But you know, we're also going to be tested on who we are and what we are. And I believe these are the tests we see coming now. What are we? Who are we? Are we who we say we are? We say we are Christians. What does that mean? And how do you define that? I believe we're being tested on who we are, what we stand for, what we do every day of our lives, and how that compares to what Christ instructed us in Scripture. Let's begin in Luke chapter 21. To me, this is an obvious place to begin as Christ gives instructions to his disciples about the future. And it goes far beyond the disciples all the way to our day today because he talks about the end time. Clearly, the end did not come during the lives of the apostles. So these verses are for us too. Luke 21, verse 34. He says, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. Again, I'm, I'm not suggesting we, everybody's out carousing around or doing all of the things that are necessarily referenced here. But what I am saying, is that life is so complicated today. It's so busy today that we can easily become so engrossed in our lives, our, you know, raising our families, and all of that's, that's certainly very important, that we fail to see what's really happening. He goes on to say, for it will come as a snare on those who dwell on the face of the earth. It will come as a snare. It'll be like a trap. It's something you don't see coming. You know, I'm, I'm continually amazed that, that we, we get surprised or we get shocked. And again, I'm shocked and surprised as well for the last two weeks. I'm not criticizing anyone. Uh, but I'm amazed at myself that we get so shocked when these big events do occur. Uh, again, I, I have to admit, I was shocked. I mean, two weeks ago, I'm in Guatemala and I'm planning for uh, some classes in Spanish and Everything is good, and, you know, we're going to be coming home. We're going to stop off in El Salvador. We'll be speaking there on the Sabbath. And here we are, in the last, last three days, the last 72 hours, all of that changed completely. The speed was shocking to me. But he goes on to say, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. So, I mean, this is a warning that you know full well. Uh, we're told to watch. Well, what does it mean to watch? Uh, look at one more verse, Mark chapter 13. In this, this uh, uh, version of what Christ said and the instructions he gave to his disciples, words it a little differently. In fact, it emphasizes the word watch. Notice this, verse 35, uh, Mark chapter 13, verse 35. Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. In the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Now think about that one word, watch, for a moment. What does it really mean for us? Is it, and this is a rhetorical question, but I, I believe I know the answer, and I think you do as well. Uh, the word watch here has embedded in it, I believe, the implication of preparation. See, it's not watch as though, well, we're sitting and watching a movie. And, well, well, look, at he did that, and look, he did that, and look, he did that. That's, I don't believe that's what Christ is saying. He's saying watch because he wants us to be prepared. So along with watch goes preparation. You watch as you are preparing. Preparing for what? Preparing for the future. Preparing for the return of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not suggesting uh, that it's wrong to, to, you know, have concern over what's happening, I, I believe that's appropriate. In fact, I believe concern, uh, as well as, as being careful and being, you know, taking appropriate action is, is certainly appropriate. Uh, but I also believe that being fearful, that is, where, where we begin to act irrationally, is not what God wants us to do. And again, I believe Mr. Horchak was making that point. Uh, Matthew chapter 10. Scripture tells us that we are not to be, you know, we're not to worry about things to the point that it becomes distracting to us. We are to be preparing as we are watching. And what are we preparing? 
Is this talking about, you know, stocking up on food or whatever else? Well, again, that's not, that's not what Christ is talking about. Christ is talking about preparing ourselves. It'd be spiritual. It'd be getting ready for the kingdom of God. That's what he's talking about. Not, again, preparing, you know, uh, again, it's wise to do certain things uh, to, because of things that could happen. I'm, I'm not criticizing any of that. Uh, that's not what Christ is talking about. Christ is talking about being prepared. Watch, and as I said, embedded in that is the implication of preparation. Uh, Mark chapter, uh, uh, let's see, no, uh, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 29. Uh, Christ uh, is, is talking here about the fear of God. He says, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your Father's will? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. You know, God called each one of us. He has a special relationship with each one of us. And it says he knows the hairs on your head. He knows everything about you. Do not fear, he says, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So if God is aware when a sparrow, and a sparrow, it says, is sold for a certain amount of money. He says, you're of a much greater value than that. And he says, don't worry, don't, don't fear, I should say. There's a word used here. Don't fear. Fear God, but don't fear man. Don't fear what the future holds. Uh, we, have a lot, we should have a lot more confidence in that. Isaiah chapter 41. Uh, we have a prophecy to Israel. But notice what God tells Israel through the prophet Isaiah. Uh, he tells them very, very clearly. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Again, this is a prophecy to Israel that uh, Israel obviously turned away from God. But I believe it gives us a, a bit of an in, in idea of God's very character, his concern for each one of us. He says, you know, don't, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And as I said, uh, certainly a concern, uh, being careful are all appropriate responses to what we see around us. But this idea of fear and, uh, you know, this, this sometimes, you know, out of control fear and worry and anxiety is really not where we should be. Now, again, you, you, I learned a long time ago, if somebody's worried about something, to say, oh, don't worry. You know, that doesn't solve anything. You know, that, that doesn't change them. And I, I'm not suggesting that we just simply say to the child, oh, well, don't worry. You know, everything's all right. Everything's good. We'll be fine. You know, the sun will come up in the morning. Everything's okay. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about a resolve where we know fully that God will take care of us and that we don't have to fear. You know, the Israelites were facing a, a, a real serious uh, problem in their lives. Look at Exodus chapter 14. I will probably be covering a, some of this or much of this during the days of unleavened bread. Uh, the first Passover in Exodus 12 and then Exodus 14 where the Israelites are, have come up to the Red Sea. You know, it, it's, it's interesting to me that the Israelites saw the, some of the greatest miracles that the world has ever witnessed. They, they really did. And in a very short period of time, from the death of the firstborn and, and all the miracles that God brought them out of Egypt, you would think that would have impressed them. But, you know, I've, I've also learned, as I'm sure you have, that human nature is rarely impressed for very long. You know, human beings aren't. Uh, you can impress them for a day or two, but, you know, a year from now, it's, it's not all that impressive. Uh, and the Israelites were certainly that way as well. And so they, they've come out of Egypt. They saw all of these miracles. Now they come up to the Red Sea, and now they are trapped. They have the armies of Egypt behind them, mountains on two sides, and the Red Sea in front of them. Uh, I think they were panicked. I think they panicked. I think panic would be an understatement for the Israelites at that point. In fact, in uh, uh, Exodus 14, verse 12, you'll see they panicked so much. Look, what, look at what they told Moses. Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. They panicked. They were ready to run in any direction they could. And only God, and God instructs Moses to tell them something in verse 13. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. That was a pretty specific promise that was made to the Israelites, and of course, God fulfilled it. He opened up the Red Sea. They walked across on dry land. Now, it did require them to do something. They, they, didn't, they couldn't just stand there. 
And I think sometimes we have to be very clear that, it, that God says he'll take care of us, but he doesn't say just stand there. You know, we stand there for a while. He told the Israelites, stand there and wait till you see this open. Uh, but they had to do something as well. And I think God wants us to do things. I think God wants us to continue doing his work. I think he wants us to continue preaching the gospel of the world. And I think he wants us to continue to care for the brethren. That's all a part of what God has mandated for us to do. And it doesn't end because there is a crisis in the world. Uh, we were prevented in many areas around this country from holding services today. Uh, it wasn't our choice in, in, in many areas. And we began to hear this yesterday. Schools that are closed down, you can't use anymore. So there were a lot of things going on that, that brought us to the decision of saying we simply would have no services today. We hope this will be the only Sabbath. Uh, we obviously need to talk about it and prepare for the future. And we need to find out in some of these places. But we, we need to do our part. We need to do our part. We need to walk forward. I don't think things are any different today than they were for the Israelites. I think we as Christians are called upon to go through trials and tests and the, as the world goes through trials and tests to see what we are truly made of, to see who we are. So this is what we need to focus on. We need to focus on who we are. Are we truly the Christians that we claim to be? You know, a Christian is who we are, uh, not that we occasionally do certain things, it's who we are. There's a difference. You know, someone can occasionally do something that's right and good, even people that have no knowledge of the truth, we know that. But Christianity is who we are, a Christian is who we are. Not simply something we have done or something we believe, it's who we are. And that's a very big difference. You know, as I mentioned earlier, that it seems like when you're going through something like this, uh, all of your senses become super uh, sensitive, where everything has, a, has an impression on you. And you know, that happened to me the last two weeks while we were in these uh, Spanish classes. You know, there were, were Spanish classes, but there were things that occurred that really, really focused my attention. And when you're learning a language, whether it be Spanish or whatever, you really have to focus and concentrate on uh, what's, what's going on in every little detail. You, know, you find out very quickly in Spanish that there, you know, there are, are uh, many words uh, that may be very similar, only one letter difference, but they say something entirely different. You know, just the simple word quanto, which, which means you know, how much. Uh, if you're talking about a price, how much does it cost? Or if you add an S to it, quantos means how many? So, you know, are you asking how, how much or are you asking how many? There's only one letter difference. An S added to the end of it makes all the difference in the world. Uh, you know, it was, it was pretty good. I, I thought I learned a lot or I know I learned a lot. I, I heard a lot. I had a, 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 an instructor who taught every day for five hours and it was, it was a real learning experience. And I actually thought I was doing pretty good. I thought, well, you know, my Spanish is not all that bad. I'm, I'm getting better. I'm learning. I'm beginning to have even flashes of things working in my head. You know, you, you, you want to get to the point where you're not having to translate into another language in your head. That the language you're hearing, you're actually understanding it. And I, I had a few flashes of that. I won't say how many, but I had a few of those. But then at the end of the, the trip after the two weeks and, and I was in a, we were in a grocery store and I, you know, I'm working with my Spanish, I'm, I'm getting things going and this young lady is at, at the checkout counter and we're conversing in you know, small ways and I'm asking for a product. And I asked her for this product in what I thought was perfect Spanish, pronounced perfectly. And she looked at me and she burst out laughing. And the young girl next to her also burst out laughing. And I couldn't figure out, what did I say? I won't tell you what I actually said, but my wife and, and uh, my daughter later on said, Dad, what an embarrassment you were. You know, you, you realize that, that, and again, it had to do with a pronunciation, not necessarily with the word. I knew the word, but it wasn't correct. And it created laughter. I, I guess I was in the bigger scheme of things happy that somebody got some humor out of what I was doing. Uh, but it was pretty humbling after two weeks to be able to, or to have that uh, happen. But there are many lessons, and then again, I come back to the two weeks that we were there in, in uh, class, and there are many lessons that, that really struck me. Uh, but one of the lessons that I think is most important, and really the one overall lesson that I, I want to 
uh, get across to you today is that we have a warning to all of us. This should be a warning uh, to all of us to be a Christian, not just believe in Christianity. That's hard to explain, but Christianity should be, you know, second nature to us or maybe first nature to us. That it's so much a part of who we are. It's the way we, we react naturally. That's what has to happen in a language. So it becomes so much a part of you that you react to it naturally. You don't have to stop and think and translate. And Well, this is Spanish. I've got to make it English and I've got to talk back in Spanish. It has to come naturally. That's the way Christianity should be. You know, I've seen this over the years and in the years that I, I pastored congregations. Uh, I saw individuals who, who came out of a particular lifestyle and I saw them change. And I saw where they, they actually took on a whole new nature from the people they were when I first met them to what they became. But you know, when it comes to, to people in the church, we see them once a week. And it's sometimes hard to really know and see what's happened in their lives and how much Christianity is now their nature as opposed to something that they, they kind of do. But it's who they are. And, but I, I had an, an example, and, and I, uh, this example means a lot to me because I saw it and witnessed it as a child growing up. Uh, my father was, uh, uh, in some ways, a very complicated individual uh, because partly of his background. My mother came to the church 10 years before he did. My father was a very, uh, and again, I, I use this term sort of uh, as a metaphor or, or things, a way that we can understand it. My father was fighting a lot of demons inside himself. And you know, it wasn't until the end of his life that he actually told us, his family, what happened in his life and the abuse he endured. And he fought these demons, this anger, so much in his life. Now, he never took it out on his family. In fact, he, he told us that he vowed, because of what he saw in his family, that he would never abuse his family. And he never did. But he, he had, he had uh, there were 15 uh, brothers and sisters, my father and his family. He was in the middle of that. And his father was very, uh, very abusive. You know, I, for many years in my life, as a young boy growing up, I saw my father had a huge scar on his foot. And he said, oh, I just tripped over an ax. And that was a story told for many years. And finally, before he died, he wanted to tell us what really happened and how his father would chase them with an ax handle and, and the abuse that he went through. It was very, very difficult. And you could see why. And you could kind of put pieces together now. My father, when I was growing up, was a very, he was, had a really high temper. Now, he never abused his family, but he was notoriously into fights. Uh, he didn't take much from anybody. Uh, they would be on the ground pretty quickly. Uh, he was just that type of person. And when my mother came to the church, he became so angry. He would literally, if he came home and found us listening to the broadcast, he would throw the radio against the wall in the house and destroy it. He would leave on a Friday, he was so angry, he would leave on a Friday at sunset and we wouldn't see him again until Saturday sunset. He was so upset with us for keeping the Sabbath. And then when God called him, when he, he, he began to study scripture, challenged my mother as to whether this was right. And then I remember the day as clearly as yesterday where he announced to us, he said, I, I want to go to church. And his whole nature changed. And, and I saw that firsthand. The people that knew my father, he was never ordained to any office in the church, but he was always there to help people. He, he, it was a part of his nature now. He, and people would say, well, he was such a gentle man. And he was such, you know, a kind man. And he was. His nature changed. And that's what's so important. Here we are. We're not playing games, brethren. You know, it has to be a change of our nature. We have to become Christians. We have to act like Christians, not just believe in something. Our beliefs are important, and we've been challenged on those, but I believe we're challenged now as to who we are. You know, the Bible makes it very clear Christianity isn't just a matter of doing some good things. It is a matter of being good. It doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. Even Christ said there's no one good but God. But the Bible screams at us to live a life that represents Jesus Christ. Christ said in Matthew 5, verse 48, to become perfect. Of course, we are to be like Christ. Perfection doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. It means you've matured, that Christianity is who you are. It's your very nature. You know, I think the Passover, of course, interesting as, as it comes up this year. But every year, I think the Passover challenges us 
each year to confirm who we are. Washing feet confirms our love for our brethren, our willingness to serve. We confirm that we are a servant at heart. We take the bread to confirm that we're willing to walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. We take the wine to confirm that we've been forgiven of our sins. This is all in one evening that we do this. It is the willingness to be a real servant, to follow Christ, and to walk away from our sins that Passover teaches us each year. This year, I believe, will be the most significant Passover that we've observed maybe ever, but certainly in a long time. Again, when, when, you're, when there are things going on of the nature that are happening now, your senses become so super sensitive and things take on a, a, a great uh, deal of importance and significance. As I said, I gave the example of 9-11, the example of the last two weeks with me. But it is important. You know, the, one of the, uh, several of the things that I, I saw in the classes that, that I experienced, and it really, uh, really struck home to me. And again, I, I'm not suggesting that all of this is some spiritual principle, but there were many spiritual principles that I saw in, in my, the simple classes that I took. Every day, uh, my instructor would give me some simple phrases. Uh, she tried to make the learning uh, enjoyable. She always began with certain phrases, and then she would always end with certain phrases, and then she would mix some out in, in the middle. Uh, I had homework to do, you know, every, every, most every evening, and we went over that. Uh, the first half hour of every class, we only talked. Uh, she would tell me things that she was involved in, uh, what she saw on the news the last evening, and I told her what I saw on the news, and we're all con we're conversing in Spanish. And uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. And we do that to begin with, then we go to the homework, and then we go to something new, and then we end. That's kind of the, the order of the classes. I found it interesting, though, that she used, and I thought it was effective, stories. She said stories about her family to make her points as to how you, you need to phrase things and how you do things when you're speaking Spanish. And it was really very helpful. I mean, I love stories. I think everyone loves stories. But to be able to hear them in Spanish and respond to them in Spanish was, was quite, a, in some ways, a revelation to me. I was struck by the fact that Christ himself uh, used parables. And that some of the parables he used, you could say, were only uh, uh, for that region. Uh, and again, please understand what I'm saying, not that they're not for us. We have them in the Bible today. But think about this. Consider the Good Samaritan as an example. The Good Samaritan consisted of the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan. Now, what other part of the world would that have even been meaningful at that time? I mean, it, it, you would have had to have lived there to know a uh, Samaritan. You know, that's somebody we don't like. A priest, you know, these are people that are religious leaders and a Levite. Again, I'm not suggesting we don't know those things today or that no one else could have. But put yourself in the first century and Christ is telling a story to make a point, and it's, kind of, it's a regional story. Well, my, my point in all of that is that the stories that the, my instructor would, would cover were really regional. In fact, some of the expressions she would give me were probably regional expressions. Maybe not necessarily the same in South America or the same in Mexico, but in Central America. But they were stories that had a point. And she would give me sayings that, that had a point. And I found them quite reflective as, as to what, uh, what it meant to me, as well as what we were going through in the last two weeks. Uh, you know, every class, she would begin with this phrase. She would begin with this phrase every morning when we started class. She, well, we would start out a little, before she would get to this particular point, uh, we would have, as I said, we would have our discussion. And she would then ask me questions in Spanish. And I had to respond. And my answer, and I got a bit discouraged at times because, you know, it was like, you don't like silence. You don't like these long pauses. I'm trying to calculate in my head. I know what she's asked me. Now, how do I respond? And I'm very slow, and it was very discouraging. My answer initially was very slow. In fact, one day I finally told her, I said, in Spanish, I said, yo estoy muy lento. You know, I'm, I'm slow. <laughs> I'm just slow. And she laughed about it, and then she gave her phrase that she used every single day at the beginning. She says, Spanish is poco a poco, poco a poco, little by little, little by little. And I thought about that quite a bit. Every morning she would see, you know, she, would tr she was trying to encourage me, and, and I was very slow. I'd get, you know, the part of the sentence, and then part of the sentence, and the next part of the sentence. 
And it's like she would rattle something off to me. I understood her, but it would take me, you know, it seemed like forever to answer or respond back. And then she would always say, uh, poco a poco, poco a poco, little by little. And, you know, I, I've thought about that uh, a lot over <laughs> the last two weeks. Because Christianity is the same way. It doesn't happen overnight. I once thought that after so many years in the church, I must get, I must be near perfection. When I was 21 and, and I'd been baptized and I thought, well, you know, 20 years, if 20 years go by, I'll be perfect. You know, I'm praying every day, I'm studying every day, well, I'll be perfect. Well, this will be my 52nd Passover. And I quite honestly, I'm ashamed to admit there are days when I believe I am just beginning. I'm sure you feel the same way at times. But you know, Satan would love to discourage us. He'd love for us to see that, that we're not getting it, we're not making any progress. But Christianity is sort of like learning Spanish. Poco a poco, poco a poco. It's one day at a time, little by little, we must be changing and making Christianity who we are, not just something we might believe in. Over the years, I've met many people who, in my mind, fit this description. I remember my early years in, in the ministry in Atlanta, Georgia. There was an elder there that, that I became very close to. He actually died within a couple of years after I was in Atlanta, but he exhibited this quality. And as a ministerial assistant, he and I worked together quite a bit in Atlanta. I'm all of 22 years old. And he sort of takes me under his wing, and, and we visit together, we socialize together. And he was always very respectful, and he had a deep love for the church and the brethren. And one day he took me down, in, I was at his home, and he took me into the basement, and he showed me this beautiful woodworking shop they had in the basement. Now, he worked for a uh, building material company. And he put this workshop in his basement. And he said, this is where we make specialized molding. And he says, I sell it to various uh, people. My company knows all about it. It's a side business. But he didn't tell me anymore at that time. Later on, I discovered that this business was set up for one purpose, and that's to help people in the church. Every nickel that that business produced went into helping someone or went into the church in general. It was his nature to help and to serve. It wasn't something he was forced to do. No one said, you know, go and open up this shop and this business because the church needs more money and people are suffering. It didn't happen that way. It was who he was. It was who he was. You know, the scripture is very clear when it talks about love for one another and our relationships with one another. The phrase one another is found 80, in 81 verses in the New Testament. Love one another is found in 12 verses. Let's look at one of those. It's 1 Peter chapter 1. So I think we sometimes minimize, again, I'm not, maybe not everyone, but we sometimes minimize the depth of this love that God tells us we should have for one another. You know, the word in, in the Greek is agape. And that's a pretty profound and powerful word that Scripture uses when talking about our love for one another. 1 Peter chapter 1. In verse 22, uh, Peter writes to the churches, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. This is that agape love. It isn't like, oh, I, you know, I kind of like you. I kind of enjoy, uh, you know, being with you. It's the deep love where we see Christ in every single brother and sister in the church. That's what we have to get to. That requires a change of your nature. It requires that. Uh, human nature, human nature, as we have been, is about you and me. It's about ourselves, I should say. We have to change our nature. Christianity is a change of nature. Sadly, over the years, and, and you've seen it as well as I have, uh, people have taken advantage of the church. You know, I remember back, of course, when we had a lot of churches, a lot of people. We'd get announcements periodically as a pastor. Be aware, of, if this person shows up in your area, don't give him any money. He's kind of going from church to church to try to get money. But brethren, shame on us if we allow those examples to cause us not to be who we should be. You know, shame on us. Those examples exist. But you know, the love for the brethren, the love for one another is very important. But it comes poco a poco. Poco a poco, a little at a time. You don't suddenly become that way overnight. 
You may feel that way overnight, but that's not what you've become. It is a journey. After the first, she would give me this first phrase, poco a poco, and she was very <laughs> encouraging to me as I was very slow in, in uh, getting my words out. Uh, the next thing we would do is go over our homework. And, you know, I, I'd get a, a tarea, homework, every night. And I would bring my homework for her, and I think, well, I've done a great job, and she would go through it. No, 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 no. Well, I studied that. I knew that. And yet it wasn't quite the same. So then she told me something. She gave me a phrase. She said, one day, one day, she, no, she's, this is all in Spanish. She says, one day, es pan, uh, es pan comido, es pan comido. So what is es pan comido? She says, es pan comido is a phrase that we use here in Guatemala, Central America, maybe in other parts as well, maybe a, a phrase uh, all over as far as I know. But it means a piece of cake. I said, oh, I understand that. A piece of cake, you know, it's, it's easy. She said, yes. And one day, she said, before you leave, you're going to come in here and you're going to say, es pan comido, when I ask you about your homework. Now, prior to that, I said, you know, it's really hard. Well, that day came about a week into the classes when I brought in my homework and everything was perfect. And she looked at me and I said, es pan comido. And we both had a good laugh. It, a piece of cake. And she said, you know why, and again, we're, we're talking in Spanish and it's a slow coming, but uh, why that was true? Because she said, when it becomes a part of, of, of the way you think, where you're not translating everything, you know, well, this means this in English and this means that in English. You actually write it out in Spanish. It becomes a part of your nature. She says, that's when it's important. And as I, I thought about that, that's when Christianity becomes real, when it's a part of your nature. You know, in, in early years in the church, in, in, uh, when I was growing up in the church, every Sunday was committed to something with the church. I mean, it really was. And it wasn't because we, we were required to. And I, maybe some people felt pressure to do it. I, uh, our family never did. We just did it. We had a lady in Mississippi, a, a widow lady in Mississippi who attended church in Memphis. And she had a small farm that she owned. But she couldn't afford to pay someone to come in and pick the cotton, harvest the cotton which is what she raised. Every year for I don't know how many years when I was growing up as a child, we packed up one Sunday, we went over early in the morning and we picked cotton all day. Now, if you know a little bit about my background, there was one thing I hated to do and that was to pick cotton. There were other things I hated to do, but I really hated to pick cotton. Uh, I, told my, I told my parents, you know, you kind of, when you're 16, 17, 18 years old, you feel like you can kind of threaten your parents a little bit. And I said, as soon as I can get out of here, I will never pick cotton again for the rest of my life. Now, I'm, I'm sorry I said that the way I said it, uh, but I'm glad I've never picked cotton the rest of my life. Uh, but we did that. If we knew somebody had a need, we picked up and we went there every Sunday. It was who we were. It wasn't a matter of, of somebody saying, you've got to go here, you've got to go there. We found out about it, and that's what we did. We cut wood for people, for widows. You know, we had sports events and things like that, but most of our Sundays were not for sports activities. They were for work and helping others because it's who we were. So when you get, and you get to the point over time, and, and I believe we're all working toward that, where it becomes es pan comido. It's a piece of cake. You don't even have to think about it. You just do it. I think that's a, a wonderful place to be, and I think that's where Christ wants all of us to be. But you know, in all of these classes, we ended the class the same way every time. And, and I, I believe that's maybe the most valuable thing I took away, in addition to the learning of Spanish. But at the end of every class, she would repeat the same phrase to me. Just like she repeated the phrase, you know, poco a poco, she repeated another phrase at the end of the class. And that phrase came about for a variety of reasons. But the phrase went like this, practica, practica, practica. Now, that means practice, practice, practice. Uh, and I saw that play out. I, I, I met a gentleman there who was also in class. His name was Neil, and he was from Canada, from British Columbia. This was his third year to come down to Antigua to study Spanish. Now, part of it, he said, was just to get away from Canada in the wintertime and come down to Antigua, which is a very pleasant place to be. But he really wanted to learn Spanish. And he said, I'd get all this knowledge. My head would be so full, it's like it's going to explode. But then he said, I would go home, and I had a problem. There wasn't a single person in his community in British Columbia that he could practice with. 
So he said, three months after I'd leave Antigua, I've lost all my Spanish. I come back again next year, I go home, I lose all my Spanish. His point was he had no one to practice with. My instructor told me, she said, you can measure your true success when I begin to dream in Spanish. And she said, when I dream in Spanish, I'm going to hear her voice saying, practica, practica, practica. I haven't quite gotten to that point yet, but her point was well made. Practice. Christianity is really the same. We must practice every day or we will lose what we have gained. You're not a Christian on the Sabbath and someone else on Sunday. You're not a Christian on the Sabbath and someone else on Wednesday. I've seen examples over the years where people were that way. And I'll tell you, it did damage, damage to people and by their example. Uh, we can't be that way, brethren. We have to be Christians. We have to practice every single day. I've been attending Sabbath services for almost 60 years. I can't even tell you how many messages I've heard over that period of time. Or even I can't quite tell you how many I've given. I'd have to go out back and research. But somewhere around 2,000 sermons myself. That's a lot of work and a lot of messages. Some were certainly better than others. I'll admit that about my own. We admonish the ministry, though, to give helpful and encouraging sermons. Yes, there's a time for correction, but it isn't every Sabbath. People need to be lifted up as they struggle with their daily lives. You know, in sports, the only way you get better is practice. In Christianity, the only way you get better is practice. That's required for all of us. As we come to this Passover, what is it that you need to practice on? Where are you falling short? Why not fast a day between now and Passover? Why not choose to do that in your pre-Passover examination? In fact, given, given the circumstances that we're under right now, it wouldn't be a bad idea to fast between now and the Passover, to search out yourself so that you become who you should be, the Christian that we all know we should be. You know, we're living through an incredible time, brethren. I don't believe God would have us be fearful or worry. He told the Israelites standing on the shore of the Red Sea facing a very dark outcome through Moses, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. It's a pretty scary world out there, but I'm confident God is telling us the same thing today. We're looking at the fulfillment of prophecy. I believe that more today than any time in my life even going back to the days when we talked a lot about prophecy and we were very specific about certain things. I believe we're living in a different time. Nothing like what has taken place in the past few weeks has ever happened before. Even if you believe this is all blown out of proportion, there's something you need to take note of. And I learned this many years ago that perception becomes reality. The reality though is that nations are closing borders, people are being put in quarantine, schools are being closed and events are being canceled around the world. That's the reality we must react to. I suggest, brethren, we be watchful, we be careful, that we not make foolish statements without having the facts. Just because you see something on social media doesn't mean it's true. I believe this virus will run its course and people will go back to their old selves, probably with some changes. Is this an example of the boy who cried wolf uh, so many times that when the wolf really came, no one heard him? Is that possible? Is that what's happening today in the world? Maybe, of course, maybe not. The Bible tells us that the fulfillment of end time prophecy will come as a surprise. And certainly, I speak for myself, the past two weeks especially have been a surprise and a real shock. And being sort of in the middle of some of it made me even see that even clearer. We cannot change the world we live in. We cannot. We can, though, be a part of saving the world in the future. And of course, that's what we've been called for. God has called us into a way of life that will lead, will lead to the salvation of the world, ultimately. And that, we know, is the important thing. The past two weeks are part of the beginning of a story that won't end well, at least in the short term. But we have a higher calling, a higher work, and we have a Savior who's promised to never leave us. Christ's final words to the disciples were that. You know, I will always be with you, even till the end. He wasn't just speaking to the disciples. He's speaking to us. He'll always be with us, even till the end. So, the last words in Matthew chapter 28. That day is coming, the end of the age. 
It won't be tomorrow, I don't believe, and it won't be next week. In fact, I'm sure it won't. But it is coming. I encourage all of us to pray for one another, love one another, stay in contact with one another, and commit to being a Christian. That it be who you are, not just something you can talk about, or not just principles, but really who you are. Christianity is really important. Who we are is really important. And I believe that a part of what's going on right now is a challenge and is a, a test and a trial for us to see who we really are. You know, Christianity is of little value without poco a poco, es pan comido, and practica, practica, practica. Important principles. Important principles that I believe I gained in a Spanish class. But you don't have to gain them in a Spanish class. They're important for us now that we do this. You know, brethren, we, we we're, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we appreciate it uh, today. It's an unusual circumstance. We appreciate the fact that, that you're here with us today. Uh, we'll continue to assess the situation and let everyone know uh, by midweek of this next week uh, whether there will be services next Sabbath. We're hoping this is short term. It is still our plan to hold Passover services and Holy Day services in all our congregations as planned. We have three weeks before the Passover, and given the past two weeks, a lot could happen in three weeks. We encourage you to pray about it. We encourage all of us to do our part, to be who we say we are, Christians, loving one another, supporting and following God's way of life.